On this show, we often meet people with brilliant ideas about how to protect the environment. But nature has its own forms of climate protection. For example, soil actually captures huge amounts of carbon dioxide. And with that, welcome to a new episode of Eco Africa. I am Sandra Twinobrio reporting from Kampala here in Uganda. And greetings from Lagos. I am Chris Alems and I'm happy to join my colleague Sandra as your host for the next half hour. These topics await you. How two women in South Africa are protecting endangered grasslands. How more and more tiny forests are springing up in Germany. And how Tunisia is making fishing more sustainable. A recent study showed that maize, collard greens and tomatoes from Kenya are often grown using highly hazardous pesticides that poses a big risk to humans, animals and the environment. Food and environmental NGOs in Kenya have been calling for a government ban on the pesticides. The draft legislation is still under consideration, but their efforts have already borne fruit elsewhere, prompting some producers and fertilizer industry to have a rethink and come up with more sustainable alternatives. The produce has to be harvested quickly. Customers in Europe want green groceries in winter too. Whether beans, chilies, herbs or fruit, most of what is grown on Himilo Farm here in Nairobi is destined for export. For a long time, Wycliffe Okumu operated a conventional farm using chemical pesticides. But he's making fundamental changes bit by bit and converting to organic methods. We've discovered we, we can have an alternative of doing that that is not harmful to our customers. So that's why we, we are trying to get into organic farming. So we already started with some few crops at the farm. We want to see how far they are going to take us, but so far we are doing well with what we have at the farm. His greatest concern is seeing harvests destroyed by plant disease or parasites. So he is drawing on the expertise of Robinson Ronyenje, whose firm Ru Organics develops organic fertilizers and pesticides. The men are currently trying out a product intended to combat pests that infest maize. So Amilo Farm has embraced organic products like this top gel. And stop gel is a foliar fertilizer, it's not even a pesticide, but uh, it has ability to suffocate pests to death. Like you can see, I'm holding some uh, maize here, which was infested by the fall armyworm, and we have just done an experiment on them, and they have died instantly. And that's without the use of any chemicals. One solution for tackling fall armyworm is made of rabbit urine, crop oil concentrates and coconut extract. Once the ingredients are mixed, the solution is ready for application. Growing demand has led to an increase in the amount of organic farming land in Kenya. According to the Kenyan Organic Agriculture Network, 173,000 hectares of land have already been certified as meeting organic standards. Kenya's parliament has been discussing a ban on hazardous pesticides for some time. Many of the pesticides still used in Kenya were prohibited on farms in Europe years ago. At the same time, the EU is continuing to tighten up the upper limits of chemical residues permitted in foods, making conventionally grown vegetables harder to sell there. Yet, the government is skeptical whether organic farming is possible in Kenya on a large scale. Part of the yield gap uh, requires good agronomic practices, of course, that improve soil health, but also protect human health. And so we have to, write, to, to find the right balance. And uh, sometimes things like uh, organic, the, the fertilizers, organic fertilizer may be good for a small plot, one acre, two acres, probably. Beyond that, you, you can't talk about organic fertilizer. It's not feasible. You, you, do, you can't produce enough of it to be able to run a, a serious farming enterprise in the country. I've never seen it being done anywhere. 
But despite all the challenges, agricultural practices in Kenya are already being transformed. More and more farms, especially smaller ones, are going organic, helped with training from experienced experts. I was trained by organic farmers and trainers and uh, I am finding the business not to be very bad because I can produce for my home and even for a market like this one where we are studying. Kikuyu Organic Farmers Market in Nairobi may still be small and it only takes place once a week, but word is already getting around about its chemical-free vegetables. That's the lure for more and more customers. They grow quite a lot of stuff here and they are doing very well. I, I usually even refer some of my friends to come here. I've introduced some of my friends to be coming here every Saturday and they do come. Himilo Farm is watching the development with great interest. This could mean a new source of income very close to home. We want to eventually get fully into organic farming because what we have also discovered is that there is a, a huge market for the organic products. If Kenya goes ahead and outlaws many hazardous pesticides, this could boost the growth of the organic farming sector nationwide. It's great that farmers in Kenya are changing their approach. A groundbreaking initiative is underway in Germany too. Space is a precious commodity in this densely populated country. This week's Doing Your Bit segment shows it's crucial to make the most of what you've got. Nothing but concrete wherever you look. It's a sad reality in many cities. But it is possible to create micro forests in urban settings. This daycare center on the outskirts of Berlin is doing just that. The soil was first analyzed in a lab to see which areas would need enriching with humus and activated charcoal. That helps the trees thrive on less space. Here, three saplings are planted on one square meter, much closer than usual. Lukas Beringer wants to see a lot of tiny forests planted in Germany. We selected 20 types of trees and shrubs based on a vegetation analysis. They're all native species. We want to try and recreate what happens naturally in a mixed forest so that we also get different levels of vegetation, a moss layer, a shrub layer and two main layers of trees. He set up the Mia organization to develop these tiny forests. It's named for the Japanese man who came up with this method, Akira Miyawaki. Funded by donations, 600 saplings worth a total of 15,000 euros will be planted here at the daycare. The organization created its first microforest 100 kilometers north of Berlin. After just one year, the bushes are bearing fruit. There are more insects too. With the help of these young foresters, it's hoped a new mini forest will soon flourish here too. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Those ecosystems can absorb and store huge amounts of carbon dioxide. While natural carbon sinks are key in the fight to curb global warming, scientists say nature can't do this massive job on its own. So improving agricultural practices could be a big help. We need to remove billions of tons of CO2 from the atmosphere fast. The technology to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at the source of its production so it can be reused or stored already exists. But it's not that simple. The potentials often don't play out as big as were anticipated. So there's still a lot of um, research needed. Also, we don't know um, how well we can really scale it up while still being cheap enough that it's worth um, it. These 800 sheep, on the other hand, do a good job without even trying. 
simply grazing, they help promote soil carbon storage without expensive technology. Thanks to their work, humus forms in the soil and humus consists of 60% carbon. The sheep are one element in farmer Tino Rue's overall concept. While most farmers leave their fields fallow after the harvest, he's sown several catch crops. As they grow, they bind further CO2 in the soil. When the intercrop starts to flower, all the power goes into the flower, as it were, and pulls out the nutrients that it previously stored in the soil. To prevent this, the sheep now come into play. They graze in this area, and their urine and excrement fertilizes the field for us. Eight years ago, the farmer switched to regenerative agriculture, mainly because of climate change. Longer droughts, alternating with short, heavy rains, made it impossible for him to continue conventional farming. Today, he mainly uses natural fertilizers and does without his plow, because plowing destroys the humus layer and lets the CO2 escape again. There are still very few farmers in Germany who work this way. Yet, in arable farming, small changes have a big effect. You could increase the soil carbon by leaving uh, more residues on the field, but also by no or low tillage, which would um, lead to less disturbance in the soils and therefore um, less of a decomposition by the microbes of the plant material that is left on site. Trees are the best known carbon reservoirs, but worldwide, forests are under threat. They're often illegally cleared or destroyed by pests and fires. Over the past 30 years, more than 4% of the world's forests have been lost that way. And more is still being destroyed than reforested. From all the um, natural, so-called natural solutions, forests are the ones that probably have the largest potential. This is simply because it's large areas um, that potentially could be afforested and forests have a rather high carbon density, so a lot of carbon per square meter. Peatlands also bind CO2. Up to 44% of the carbon sequestered in soil worldwide is stored there. But in Germany alone, more than 90% of the country's peatlands have been drained for agriculture. But if moisture is removed from a bog, the peat bog dries out and carbon dioxide escapes into the environment. In the long term, experts are considering re-wetting Germany's peatlands. The CO2 accumulation in peatlands is something that occurs on the timescales of centuries, which is obviously not quick enough for the solutions we need here. Tino Rill's regenerative agriculture with his sheep and catch crops works faster. Good soil smells a little like carrots, he says proudly. The growing humus layer ensures a loose soil, so rainwater can penetrate and is stored by the roots. It's always said that roots form soil and soil forms plants. That's the way it is here. If you reach in, it has a crumbly structure. Here you see flax, the root of the flax, and the whole root network. And roots act on the ground like the steel reinforcement in concrete, which strengthens a structure. And it's the same with the soil. About half of the humus layer worldwide has been destroyed in recent decades due to intensive farming. Tino Rue wants to get more farmers interested in his approach and promotes it on his Instagram channel. In the southern hemisphere, mangrove forests are particularly effective in storing carbon. Experts estimate the benefit at more than $65 billion per year, primarily as coastal protection against erosion and as a nursery for fish. They have a very high carbon density, so a lot of carbon per square meter of mangrove forest. A lot of that is in the sediments, not just in the biomass, which makes sense looking at the mangrove forest, it's not um, all that big compared to a tropical rainforest, for example. But in the sediments, in the soils that they keep there with their roots, there can be a lot of carbon stored. There is no one natural carbon sink extracting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but nature provides us with a number of options. 
And first and foremost, we need to reduce our CO2 emissions. Well, forests are important carbon sinks. Up to 40% of the Earth's land is covered with grassland. This underappreciated biome is an important source of protein and stores carbon as well. Unfortunately, some of the expansive grasslands in South Africa's Eastern Cape are threatened by mining, erosion and overgrazing. Nidileka Marubela is happy. She just sold three of her cows for the equivalent of over 1,000 euros. She's a single mother, and the mobile cattle auctions organized by environmental and rural solutions are a godsend. These auctions are very good for us and very vital for us because we don't hire transport to take the, our stock to the site for selling. They come to us, and some, sometimes we do negotiate the price if we are not satisfied. In the past, smallholders in South Africa's grasslands could only buy from and sell to their neighbors. The big cattle auctions were held much too far away. The Environmental and Rural Solutions, or ERS, organization launched the auctions in 2014. Since then, 3,800 cattle have gone under the hammer for a total of 1.7 million euros. That's benefited more than 500 families. The cattle bred here on the grasslands are renowned for their excellent quality. Environmental scientist Nikki McLeod and soil scientist Lipalesa Sisimatela founded ERS 20 years ago. The cattle auctions are just one part of a wider scheme to promote sustainable practices in rural areas. Much of the grasslands has been badly degraded. The fragile ecosystem has been jeopardized by overgrazing and mismanagement. The grasslands cover 10% of South Africa, but supply 60% of the drought-stricken country's water needs. Against a backdrop of global warming and climate change, problems such as overgrazing, soil erosion and water security have become more urgent than ever. So keeping this beautiful grassland intact as a water absorber, it's basically the skin on the ground, the skin on the earth, keeping this grassland intact is so important for replenishing our water source areas. Mm. But tackling the issue of overgrazing in a region that depends on livestock farming is a challenge. Okay. One solution involves reviving an age-old herding tradition, Maboela. It started a long time ago with our forefathers. The way they used to do it was to pile up some stones and paint them. That way, the community knew which side was fallow and which side was for grazing. This traditional system of land rotation had been used for a very long time. But as more and more people left the area to find work in the cities, the practice died out. A lot of uh, the younger people didn't understand it, but if they talked to the elders of the community, then it was easier to have the system more accepted. The other challenge that we have that is major around here is livestock theft. Here in the grasslands, 47% of young people are unemployed and crime rates are soaring. But ERS has found a solution to that problem as well. In the village of Mparana, sheep are being tattooed, so it's clear who they belong to. That makes stealing them pointless. The branding is done by eco-champs young people trained by the ERS team as veterinary paramedics. They work by themselves, distributing medicine and vaccinating livestock on remote farms. It's a very successful project. I used to have uh, 12 cattle, 5 sheep, but now due to this association helping us with the vaccination and other medicines, I, I'm having now 30 uh, la, 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 sheep, I'm having 20 cattle due to this. 
Lipasela Sisimatela and Nikki McLeod have convinced many people here in Eastern Cape Province that living in harmony with nature benefits them too and helps secure their livelihoods. Now, that's how it is done. An initiative is successful when nature can be protected and people can still make ends meet. The creators of the project in our next report also embraced that concept. That's right, Sandra. Next, we go to Tunisia where fishers are in trouble waters. According to an EU study, the Mediterranean Sea has been fish stocks dropped by a third over the last 50 years. The vast majority of native species are now threatened by overfishing. Visitors entering the town of Zarzis will notice a work of art that looks more like wishful thinking than the reality on the ground. Precious few fishers in Tunisia bring in a decent catch these days. Many simply abandon their boats, and young people are leaving. Looking at the current situation, I have to say that there is no future in fishing. I can only tell young people to consider a different line of work. Biologists from the National Institute of Marine Sciences and Technology in Sfax are looking for reasons behind the dwindling fish stocks. The prime suspect? Toxic algae, which repeatedly turn the seawater red. Climate change, high water temperatures, and rising phosphorus and nitrogen levels provide a perfect environment for the algae to flourish. Native species, such as sea bream, suffocate and are dying off in huge numbers. We discovered that a toxic species of algae is responsible for this phenomenon. In 2019, there was a very high concentration of the algae species called Carinia brevis. In 2020, its stocks were slightly lower. But this year, they've increased again. Especially in the area around the port of Gabès. To make ends meet, fishers frequently resort to illegal methods, such as catching fish that are actually too young and small to sell, like this swordfish. At the fish market in Sfax, you'll also find cartilaginous fish, like rays and sharks, which are in fact endangered and protected species. Bashir Saidi and Nidal Trabelsi are trying to reverse the trend. They want fishers to stop catching sharks and other endangered species. They're part of the project Med Bycatch, which was launched two years ago and began with extensive data collection. We've collected a lot of data, which we'll use to make proposals on how to reduce unwanted bycatch of endangered species for all of Tunisia. Nidal Trabelsi has developed a good relationship with the fishing community in the port of Zarzis. He tells them about the research results and provides insights into the concept of closed season. This is when the different species lay their eggs and can't be fished. The evaluation of the samples makes it clear that fishing in the Mediterranean must become more sustainable. One solution would be using different fishing methods. Trawling can be replaced by long lining, which involves long plastic lines with sardine baited hooks attached at around six meter intervals. Med Bycatch plans to recommend this type of fishing. With long line and hook line fishing, the fish have the choice. The fish that go for the bait get caught. The others don't. It's completely different to trawling, which basically catches everything in the sea. Lasat Ben Shuika is an advocate of the long line method, but today he can't go fishing. The wind is too strong and the waves too big. Conditions are simply too dangerous. So he heads back to the harbor. Preserving the ecosystem in the Mediterranean will also require more fishermen like Lasad Ben Shuika to switch to alternative methods. And not only in Zarzis, but across Tunisia, 
and along the coasts of other countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea. We've got to interact with our planet in a more sustainable way. Nature has an incredible ability to regenerate, but we can't leave it up to nature alone. That's all from Echo Africa Today. I am Chris Alems, signing off from Lagos. Thank you, Chris. I will say goodbye too, but I hope our viewers do stay in touch. Visit us on all our social media platforms. All the best until next week and do stay safe. I am Sandra Twinobio. Goodbye from Kampala here in Uganda. Uh -oh.